the biblical principles of what a church should be in manifesting the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Hour of Faith, originating from the sanctuary of the Faith Baptist Church of Alton, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. As you participate in today's broadcast, may the Lord challenge your heart with the word. seating you may be seated and we do want to welcome each and every one of you joining us by the media ministries to the faith baptist church of altoona pennsylvania the united states of america and wherever you might be we truly do thank you for the pleasure of your company what a joy it is to be able to bring this service to you and it is our prayer that you can say as we've just sung it is well with your soul in that you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and that you are living in Christ and life of obedience. But certainly it's a delight to have you there. And if we could never serve you spiritually, as we say week after week, don't hesitate to contact us. You can see our contact information there on the screen. Our website is www.fbcaltuna.org. And you go there, you can find out a whole lot of things that are taking place around the church, but also our phone number is there. And if you have a prayer request right now, don't hesitate to call that in and uh, we will pray for you. And if you're listening by radio, you can't see that. The number is 814-944-2894. And we'd encourage you to let others know about this ministry. Uh, you can watch this service uh, on television, you can listen to it on radio, you can find it online, you can find it on YouTube and whatever, because we have the desire to get out the Word of God. And if this service and this ministry is a blessing to you, we would encourage you to let others know. And I do want to thank each and every one of you that we do hear from, from time to time. Our goal is that you know Christ. The Bible says we've all sinned and have come short to the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, which means to be delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Would you trust Christ as your Savior today? If you've never done that, I would encourage you to simply say, Lord Jesus... I trust you to save me. And if your heart's in that, you believe it. 
He will save you. And I'd invite you to contact us here at the church, and we will send you information that will help you to get started right in your Christian life. Coming up in just a couple of weeks, we will be having a conference on missions here at the Faith Baptist Church. And our speaker is going to be Dr. Wendell Calder of Local Church Evangelism. And uh, I would encourage you to go to our website, which is www.fbcaltuna.org, and uh, see the information that is there. Our theme is going to be resharpening our focus on missions. And on uh, Friday evening, the 6th of April, and Saturday morning, the 7th of April, we're going to be having a seminar on missions for church leadership. We've invited all of our leaders here to be involved, but we'd invite you, if you are involved with a local church and you're in the position of leadership, we'd invite you to come on out and participate too. Call us at 814-944-2894 and we will uh, give you all the information that you need to know about that. But also that evening, that is the evening of the 7th of April, we will be having a, uh, a, a youth rally. And uh, Dr. Wendell Calder will be speaking, uh, be giving a good message and a good challenge on missions. And so I would invite you to uh, come out and bring your young people. A number of churches will be going together in this rally, but you, I don't know who you are, where you are, what you're doing, but if you've got young people and you're concerned about the possibility of them serving in full-time vocational ministry, then I would invite you to bring them out for that youth rally that evening, April the 7th from 6 and to 8, and then, of course, Sunday, a mission Sunday. So that is April the 6th through the 8th, and I've got a little flyer that's in our bulletin here. You can see that at a distance, I guess, but if you go to our website, www.fbcaltuna.org, then you can see that and you can learn more about it, and we'd encourage you to pray for it and plan on coming out and being a part of us on our conference on missions. I was sinking deep in sin, but love lifted me. We're going to sing that song. It's number 629 in our hymn book. And those of you joining the Media Ministries, if you know it, sing along with us. Love lifted me, standing as we sing. <clears throat>
God's children said, Amen. 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 Well, that's the fruit of Jamie Eisenhart. <clears throat> Thank you, Jamie, for your ministry. And uh, to those of you who are joining us media, this is her last Sunday and she'll be moving with her husband out to Michigan. And we've appreciated the ministry that she's provided, such as that that you've just heard. To God be the glory. And somebody's going to be taking her place on the piano. We, we learned the other night it was Chris Davis. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but what a blessing. Thank you. And thank you, reverence. 
And just pray for us, please, as, as we go on from this point. We appreciate that very, very much. God bless, God bless you richly. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word this morning, please turn with me to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, last Sunday morning we began a series entitled Taking a Closer Look at the Biblical Worldview. And we are doing this to sort of lay a foundation again, or maybe I should say to put another building block on what we're dealing with here in the church throughout the course of this year, and that is apologetics, knowing how to defend our faith. And we are dealing with that through the Sunday school department, going through Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And, of course, we are doing it these days on Sunday nights, uh, looking at various aspects of knowing how to portray the truth and evangelism, understanding what the Word of God says and defending it. But the foundation for defending our faith and having a good defense of our faith and understanding apologetics is that of having a biblical worldview. And we've talked about that many times in the past, and uh, a number of years ago that was our theme throughout the course of the entire year. But these days we are visiting it once again, and uh, I began looking at it with you last week, and I want to continue that today. We'll review a little bit of, of what I stated last week, and uh, then of course dig a bit deeper into some of these things. And you'll say, Pastor Gary... Why are you taking so much time on this these days? Why are you reviewing what we talked about last week? Well, the reason for that is simply because of the fact that most Christians do not have a biblical worldview. Most Christians do not have a biblical worldview. They say they do, they think they do, but they really don't. And uh, in just a few moments, I'm going to read from a book that's written by George Barna entitled, Think Like Jesus. And from that reading, and I'll, I'll take an extended time to read it, from that reading, you will find that many pastors don't have a biblical worldview. Many pastors aren't teaching their congregations the biblical worldview, though they think that they are. And the pastors in the pulpit don't have it. How in the world can the people in the pews have it? And so that's why we're taking some time. And I don't apologize at all for repeating some of the things that I mentioned last week. Repetition and review is the best teacher. And these are some things that we need to learn and understand. So last week we looked at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 21. And I invite you to turn there again as I also invite you to stand as I read and you follow along in your copy of God's Word. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through 21. Where the Word of God says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. You see, Peter even repeated things, and if he did, I guess I can too. Verse 13. Yea, I think it is meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. I want to pause here. Unfortunately, what happens in the church of Jesus Christ today and what happens in a lot of local churches is that they follow cunningly devised fables, stories that mean nothing. And that's why today we find that the concept of the biblical worldview is not really known and understood. It's because many times what is given over the pulpit is not truth and what is believed in the hearts of the believers is not truth. Nothing more than a cunning, devised fable. Think about that, building the church on that. What a shame. What a shame. But nevertheless, that happens. Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And that would be recorded in Matthew 17. Verse 19 is our key verse. Actually, verses 19, 20, and 21. It says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God promises to bless his word and we thank him for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and I pray that as we continue to study this concept of the biblical worldview that you'll teach us that we might learn according to your truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Now, last week when we looked at verse 19, I mentioned that there were certain things that we observe about the Word of God that lays the foundation for the biblical worldview. We noted that God's Word is sure, where He says, For we have also a more sure word of prophecy. We noted that God's Word is to be obeyed, because it says, Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. We learned last week that God's word is light, for it says, Take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. And then we learned that, that God's word directs us until we see Christ, as it says, Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. But another reason why this verse is the foundation for the biblical worldview is because of three other things we see from this passage of Scripture going on to verses 20 and 21. Verse 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, keep in mind that when he's talking about prophecy here, he's not just talking about that which Jeremiah and Isaiah and those in the Old Testament prophesied. He's talking about the entirety of the Word of God. Sure, the prophecies came as God led, but so also does everything in the Old Testament and the New Testament come as God has led. So, uh, as we look at these verses, we see once again the foundation of the biblical worldview because of three things. Number one, because the Word of God is actual. Look, if you would please, again at verse 19. It says, For we have also a more sure word of prophecy. In the Bible, we have actually the Word of God. When we pick this book up and read it, it's God's Word that we are reading. This is actually the Word of God. That's why this book lays the foundation for the biblical worldview and why we are to obey it. It's actually the truth of God. But secondly, we see that the Bible is absolute. Absolute. Because he says there in verse 19, Whereunto ye do well to take heed. This book is absolute truth. We find today that there are folks who say there is no absolute truth. The truth can be anything that you want it to be. But this word of God is absolute truth. It's absolute truth, which is why we need to be in it. It's absolute truth, which is why we need to build a worldview upon the word of God, the absolute truth of God. And then not only is the word of God actual and absolute, but it's authoritative. It's our authority. 
He says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not self-thought. Peter didn't come up with this on his own. Jeremiah didn't come up with this on his own. Uh, No one came up with this on their own. Forty human authors, but nobody came up with it on their own. But as it says in verse 21, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved, that is driven, driven, literally driven, by the Holy Ghost. And so when we pick up the Bible and read it, it is the Word of God. It's actual. It's absolute. It's authoritative. Therefore, it lays the foundation for the biblical worldview. Now, last week I mentioned to you that everybody has a worldview. If if you don't have a worldview, you don't know even how to function. Uh, You can't function. You can't meet the circumstances of life if you don't have a worldview. Unfortunately, some worldviews are wrong. Last week, we talked about the naturalistic worldview and the transcendental worldview and the Christian worldview. But what we are striving for here is the biblical worldview. And I define for you the biblical worldview as this, that God is real. And the creator of all things. Humanity is responsible to live according to God's absolute truth through Jesus Christ. And life will be spent in eternity either in heaven or in hell based upon one's response to Jesus Christ. That's the definition of the worldview I've given you as per this series. In short, a biblical worldview is looking at the world through the lens of the Word of God. That's what you want to write now. Looking at the world through the lens of the Word of God. Everything that we face in life, we are to look at it through WDTBS. What does the Bible say? Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, not every Christian has a biblical worldview. Too many Christians have allowed secular worldviews to to guide their thinking, to guide their thoughts, to guide their attitudes. Many pastors don't have a biblical worldview. And many pastors who think they have one don't. A number of years ago, I, I took a survey of Christian schools, not Bible colleges now, but Christian day schools. And, and, and I asked them, do you teach the biblical worldview in your school? Obviously, what was their answer? Yes. yes. So then I began to say, well, what do you do to teach a biblical worldview? Well, we teach the Bible. Or we have chapel once a week or twice a week or whatever. In the five Christian day schools that I interviewed... I found that not one of them really got down into the nitty-gritty in teaching the biblical worldview to young people who are in their schools. Now, some did. Those are the ones we like to stand with. Others really didn't even know. Administrators didn't know how to define the biblical worldview. But the same is the case with pastors. And maybe that's why the schools don't teach it. Because maybe... We don't teach it over the pulpits in our churches. George Barna has become a great friend of mine over recent years. He has written book after book after book after book after book. And he has one here called Think Like Jesus that that I would encourage you to get because he talks in here a lot about the biblical worldview. And if you would uh, bear with me for a little bit, I want to read a couple of pages, all right? Now, don't go home and say the pastor didn't do anything but read to us today. But I'm sure somebody will say that, you know. But yes, I am reading to you, but I'll be doing some other things too if you just pay attention. But listen to this from George Barnett. And and you'll see why this is close to my heart and a burden on my heart, all right? He says there were three of us still hanging around in the church foyer after a full day of teaching. Of the 300 or so pastors who had attended the seminar I'd been leading in Charlotte, North Carolina, 
These last two men were talking through discipleship strategies with me when I popped the question. So what do you guys do to help your people get a biblical worldview? The taller of the two, balding, with 20 plus years experience, wasn't me because I got more than that, 20 plus years of experience in the pastorate wasted no time answering. He said, we have missionaries speak in our services several times a year. Every Sunday school class has time set aside to read a brief report and pray about faith-related events happening in other parts of the world. And we have a summer missions trip for families that always fills up quickly, he proclaimed. He said, we work hard to make sure that they realize the American church is not the total sum of God's work in the world. Our people get it. Now, in your intelligence, I ask you, how does that pastor teach the biblical worldview? You will notice he said nothing about it. Well, those are my comments. Let me go on. See, I, I am doing more than reading to you. Well, his colleague, a decade his junior and relatively new to the pastorate, took up the baton without missing a beat. Well, what we do is preach through the entire Bible every five years. We have all of our teaching venues, the service, the Sunday school classes, the youth groups, and even cell groups focus on the same passages covered in the sermon that week, ensuring that we give all the key scriptural principles adequate consideration. By the time we're through the cycle, they've all been exposed to all the basic principles of Christianity and will have a biblical worldview. You remember last week I defined the difference between a Christian worldview and a biblical worldview? We want a biblical worldview. That's what the Bible says. I mentioned last week that the Christian worldview is not what we're seeking after because the Christian worldview can vary based upon what church, what group, what denomination you're talking about. You understand what I'm saying? You want a biblical worldview. The Baptists would have one worldview. The Presbyterians would have one. The Pentecostals would have one. The Catholics would have one. Others would have... We're not looking at a Baptist worldview. We're looking for a biblical worldview. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm talking about when I say not a Christian worldview, but a biblical worldview? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Well, I think these guys missed the mark. Well, George Barna goes on and says... The two beamed, clearly pleased at what they said. After complimenting each other, they turned to me, waiting for words of praise and encouragement. As the seconds ticked on and on and on, I continued to gaze at them without responding. If you know George Barna, he does that. He, some of you have heard him on Stand in the Gap, but he just, he'll, he'll just look at you. And I can picture this. He says, as the seconds ticked by, I continued to gaze at them without responding. Their smiles began to fade and curiosity set in. The younger pastor said, that's what you meant, isn't it? What's that say? He had no idea what a biblical worldview was. Got it? Are you with me? George goes on, he says, I had a disappointing sense of deja vu. I heard similar replies countless times in different areas of the United States where I go to teach pastors and learn from them. Not wanting to offend or discourage them, I tried to ease into my reply. Well, those are very helpful activities for sure. It would be beneficial if more churches helped their people as you have to develop a global perspective on God's Word and to have regular teaching related to the totality of His Word. Then I paused, George says, searching for what I hoped would be clear but not disheartening words. And so he said, but a biblical worldview is more than that. I continued with what I prayed would be a persuasive description. He said, a biblical worldview is thinking like Jesus. 
It is a way of making our faith practical to every situation we face each day. A biblical worldview is a way of dealing with the world such that we act like Jesus 24 hours a day because we think like Jesus. Make sense? He says, I offered an analogy. It's like having a pair of special eyeglasses we wear that enables us to see things differently, to see things from God's point of view, and to respond to those perceptions in the way that God would prescribe if He were to provide us with direct and personal revelation. As we continued talking, these two pastors raised questions about a biblical worldview similar to those of other pastors and church leaders whom I have had such discussions with over the past several years. It was clear that even though believers in this nation are in desperate need of a biblical life lens, implementing such a developmental process in churches, schools, homes, and ministries around the country... This was not going to happen overnight. A lot of foundations need to be put in place. Then he says, what is this biblical worldview thing? For years I was scared off by the term biblical worldview. It had, a, it had connotations of breadth, breadth and depth that were overwhelming. But the more I realized that my own Christian life was a haphazard series of disjointed choices only marginally and inconsistently influenced by my faith, the more I determined I became to get serious about worldview development. I ask you, are you serious about worldview development? Are you? If not, why not? Particularly from the biblical perspective. He goes on to say we all have worldviews. Once involved in the process, I soon learned that there is no reason to be frightened about the concept of worldview development. Instead, I ought to be more worried by the fact that I already had a fully developed and operational worldview that I wasn't aware of. It was secular. While most people never think about their worldview on a conscientious level, everyone has one. Our moment-to-moment decisions are shaped by the worldview we have adopted and adapted over the course of time, often without realizing that we are dependent upon such a framework for decision-making. It's a serious thought. And I wrote in red in my book, that's a serious thought, just like I just said. If we are not biblically based, we can adapt a secular worldview to our lives without knowing it. That's the serious thought. George goes on to say, Whenever we make a decision, we unconsciously run it through a mental and emotional filter that allows us to make choices consistent with what we believe to be true, significant, and appropriate. The filter is the result of how we have organized information to make sense of the world in which we live. Without a worldview, we'd be incapable of arriving at many of the hundreds of decisions we make each day because every option would just be as appealing as every other. To make even minor choices, we need to rely on our sense of right and wrong, good and bad, Uh, useful and useless, appropriate and inappropriate, to produce what we believe are the wisest choices. From our earliest days out of the womb, we have been creating this understanding of how life works and the best options pursue. If you listen to Stand in the Gap today, you will recall that recently we read a report, and I think it was by George Barna, that says that world view begins to be developed when a child is how old? 18 months. Months. You know, we often talk about why children leave home when they go off to college. Why they leave the, I mean, why they leave the church when they go off to college. This particular report that we put on the radio here a while ago said they don't leave church when they go off to college. They leave church in the second grade. 
Because moms and dads did not teach sound doctrine and local churches did not teach sound doctrine. And from the second grade on, they're just waiting to leave the home. And some of you have got Christian children who are away from the Lord, don't you? Maybe, maybe you need to go back and ask them, did we teach you a biblical worldview or did we just talk about it? Did we illustrate it or did we just tell you to have one? Barna goes on and says, A biblical worldview is a means of experiencing, interpreting, and responding to reality in light of biblical perspective. This life lens provides a personal understanding of every idea, opportunity, and experience based upon the identification and application of relevant biblical principles so that every choice we make may be consistent with God's principles and commands. At the risk of seeming simplistic, it is asking the question, what would Jesus do if he were in my shoes right now? And applying the answer without compromising because of how we anticipate the world reacting. I never saw this book until this week. I ran across it in, a, in an advertisement and I said, Danielle, please order this for me. And she did. And uh, so I just picked it up and began to read it on Friday. And I'm glad to see that some of the things that George Barna said, I have said and agree with. Why? Because it's what the biblical worldview is all about. I encourage you to get it. It's called Think Like Jesus. Not a new book, written in 2005. Good book to help you. About three years ago, I was a part of a group of pastors that took a test on the biblical worldview. Twelve pastors took the test on whether or not they understood the biblical worldview. Nine of the twelve made less than 50%. Two of the twelve got from 50 to 70%. One of the twelve got a 90%. This goes to show where we as pastors are. And so if we as pastors don't have a biblical worldview, what about the person in the pew? Do you understand why we're taking some time on this and why we are reviewing it? Because if we are going to stand for truth these days, we, know, we need to know WDTBS. Remember that? What does the Bible say? Say that with me. What does the Bible say? Our opinion doesn't count. When we stand before God, and God starts to ask us questions. It'll be Jesus Christ asking us questions. The answers that we give based upon our opinion will not count. The answers that we give must be based upon the word of God. We need that biblical worldview. And I can see that my time's going again, but that's okay. The Lord Willing, we'll continue. I'm not done yet, so don't go home, but I can just see that our time's running out here. But I do want to go back and review a little bit of what I talked about last week, and I want to show you from the pages of Scripture what we're talking about, all right? Last week, we looked at the essence of the biblical worldview. And there are many passages. The one that we have here out of 2 Peter says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, unto the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. But there are some other passages of Scripture that you know. You memorized them when you were a knee-high to a snake. In Bible school or Sunday school, some of you, and I know some of you got saved when you were a little bigger than a snake, but, you know, a lot of us learned some of these verses years ago. For instance, turn with me back to the Psalms. I'm going to give you two verses of Scripture, three verses of Scripture that you all know, but I want you to see it. I want you to mark it. I want you to take heed to it once again for the first time, as it were. Psalm 119. The biggest psalm in the Psalter. Verse 105. 
I know somebody knows that verse. Psalm 119, 105. You memorize it. What does it say? Somebody say it. Amen. That's it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What is that talking about? It's talking about the biblical worldview that gives us the direction in life. A lamp under my feet so that I don't stumble in the darkness. A light under my path so that I can see the way that I'm going. That's a biblical worldview. But if it's going to be our light, if it's going to be our lamp, we need to be what? In it. And we need to allow it to what? Dwell in us richly, as Paul says to the Colossians. Go over a few more verses. Psalm 119. And uh, look, if you would please, at verse uh, uh, 130. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It gives understanding unto the simple. Now, <clears throat> that applies to all of us. We're all kind of simple. Not in the sense of being funny or clowns, but simple in that our understanding of truth is limited. We need to know what the Word of God says. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Two verses of Scripture that we've probably memorized and meditated upon many times. But yet, many of us don't live according to a biblical worldview. See, the biblical worldview, in short, is viewing everything through the lens of the Word of God. In other words, learning what the Bible teaches and then ordering our lives accordingly. <clears throat> Let me share with you some very well-known verses that lay the foundation for this concept of viewing everything through the lens of the Scripture. I do not have the time to elaborate upon it again today, but I want to give you the verses. I want us to look at them together. And I encourage you to meditate on them as we go from this place. Number one, if we are going to have <clears throat> a biblical worldview, we need to recognize that the Scripture is absolute truth. It's absolute truth. Truth. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 17. The Gospel of John, chapter 17. And the Lord Jesus is praying this high priestly prayer of His to the Father. We won't go through it all. It'll be a great prayer to go through. But notice He says in verse 17, Jesus in praying says, Sanctify them, that is His disciples, His followers, you and me. Sanctify them through Thy truth. Let's read those next four words together. Thy word is truth. Thy word is absolute truth. What this word says is true. There's no debate. There's no discussion. And you know, this is a thing that concerns me greatly. So many times when people get together and study, whether it be a Sunday school class or a Bible study, they look at a passage of Scripture and they say, well, my opinion about that is this. And somebody else says, well, my opinion about that is that. It's not our goal when we study the Bible to figure out what our opinion is. It's our goal when we study the Bible to know what the Bible says because it's absolute truth. Amen. And it's the study of this book that enables us to understand what that absolute truth is. Your opinion and mine does not count. Only thus saith the Lord does, for this is absolute truth. Secondly, having this biblical worldview means we recognize that the Scripture is is, is inspired of God. Again, you know the verses, but let's look at them. I want you to see them for yourself. You know, the best way to learn the Bible is to follow along with the teacher or the preacher. Go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You know this verse, this passage, and so do I, but let's look at it again. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Some scripture is, is given by the inspiration of God. Aha, uh -huh. all. What does all mean? Oh, we're talking about the original manuscripts, the original autographs given as were written by the apostles and the prophets and so forth. It's all given by inspiration. That means God breathed. 
God breathed. God breathed. Wish we had time to expand on that. I don't. We're going to do that next Sunday morning in the membership class. Come on out and join us. But that means it's God breathed. In other words, what we read here is what God wants us to know. And it is profitable. That is, it's relevant. We've got people today saying the word of God is not relevant. Oh, yes, but it is. The problem with it is this. Rather than taking the word of God for what it says, we've added our opinion and our own thoughts and our own ideas. And every time we add our opinion and our thoughts and our ideas, we water down the word of God. We need to take God's word for what it is, for what it says, for it is inspired of God and profitable for doctrine. That's teaching about who Christ, who God is. For reproof, it shows us when we are wrong. For correction, it sets us up again once we've been wrong. And for instruction in righteousness, that is, it teaches us righteous living. Why that or in order that the person of God may be perfect, the child of God may be perfect, the man of God, the woman of God may be perfect, truly, truly, truly furnished unto good works. This word of God is inspired of God. No man's thoughts, <clears throat> no woman's thoughts have been put into it <clears throat> when we pick up and read it. It's what God wants us to know. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you practice it? Thirdly, <clears throat> the essence of the biblical worldview means recognizing that Scripture is accurate in all things. The Word of God is accurate in everything that it says. Turn back to the book of Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. There is no inaccuracy in this book. If you're reading through the Bible and you come across with what appears to be a contradiction... It's not the Bible's fault. It's that you just haven't understood it yet. So continue to study what appears to be a contradiction and see how God brings the truth to you. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. It says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee and be found a liar. Don't add to this book. Revelation says don't take away from it or God will take your part out of the lake of fire. Boy, I don't have time to speak on that one. I wish I did. doesn't mean you'll lose your salvation. But what it does mean is people who take away from this book. Are you listening? People who take away from this book are not saved. Did I say they'll take your part out of the lake of fire? I didn't mean that. He says, if you take out of this word, it takes, God will take your part out of the book of life. I almost taught fake news. <laughs> the point is, take out of this book, God's word says your part is taken out of the book of life. What's that teach? <clears throat> I personally think it means that this person who takes away from this word is not saved. And we could d d discuss that, but I, as you p compare Scripture with Scripture, I think that's a full teaching in that passage. But here's the point. Don't add to it because every word is pure. Let me give you another one or two. Deuteronomy 12.32. Taking this whole concept of the biblical worldview is recognizing that the Scripture is absolute authority. It is absolute authority. Deuteronomy chapter 12. In verse 32, Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32, it says, What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Why? Because it is absolute authority from the absolute God. So we don't add to it or take away. And then finally, having this Biblical worldview and understanding the essence of it is recognizing that the scripture is eternally preserved. Aren't you thankful that this word is not going to be changed? We've got a lot of people trying to change it through various means. But this word is eternally kept. God wrote it. 
It's settled and there is no more revelation given. Every now and then you'll hear somebody say, God has given me a great revelation. If somebody comes to you and says, God has given me a great revelation, you ask them, what book of the Bible and chapter did, did you get that from? And hopefully they'll show you something in the scripture. If they say to you, well, something just came to me in a dream, you say, You've had too many onions for supper the night before. There is no more revelation than what is here in this book. It's complete. And it's settled. Look at Psalm 119 and verse 89. Psalm 119 verse 89 says, Forever, what does that mean? Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So, the essence of a biblical worldview is recognizing that Scripture is absolute truth. It is inspired by God. It is accurate in all things. It is absolute authority. And it is eternally preserved. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? That is the foundation of having a worldview that is biblical, that will guide you into all truth and lead you to pleasing the Lord. See why we're taking time on this? Do you understand it? Because I know that there are people under the sound of my voice who have thought they have a biblical worldview, but they don't. Statistics show it. Now, as I look out over this congregation, I don't have anybody in mind. Don't say, who's the preacher talking about today? I'm not doing that. But the fact of the matter is, many Christians don't know what the biblical worldview is, and thus the Word of God is not ordering their lives. That's what we're talking about these days that lays the foundation for being able to defend our faith. My question to you this morning is, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? The Bible says that we've all sinned and have come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you've not yet trusted Christ as Savior, I encourage you to call upon His name and be saved. But then dig into this book. Spend time in it. Allow it to dwell richly in your life. And watch how you develop a worldview that's biblical and honoring to God. Get to know the Word. Let the Word guide you. You live a biblical worldview. We will continue, the Lord willing, on this important subject. Let's stand for prayer. Father, I pray that you will take your Word today and use it in our lives for your glory in Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn is number 485. <coughs> Have thine own way, Lord. And this should be our prayer. Make it your prayer. Have thine own way, Lord, as we sing number 485. broadcast of the Hour of Faith, which originated from the sanctuary of the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, 31540 Street in the Highland Park section of the city. Dr. Gary G. Dolan, the family of faith, welcomes you to Sunday school at 9.30, morning worship at 10.30, Sunday night service at 6, with youth programs, adult prayer and Bible study, Wednesdays at 7, with foundations for faith every Wednesday night during the school year. If we may ever be of any spiritual help to you, Please call 814-944-2894. Log on to our website at www.fbcaltuna.org or write to The Faith Baptist Church, 31540 Street, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 16602, USA. I'm JT Teeter. Till the next time we meet, may the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him. <laughs>